From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Four months into the coronavirus pandemic, our lives have been upended. Our livelihoods and our economy have shifted dramatically. Many families are facing stressful challenges and uncertainty. At the same time, many cities and counties are beginning to reopen. And as parents go back to work, access to high quality, affordable child care is fundamental to the well-being of families and children. Oregon Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici joins us to shine a light on the struggles families, child care providers and child care workers are facing as many child care centers may not survive the pandemic. And she says fixing the child care system is also an issue of racial justice as the child care workforce is overwhelmingly women and predominantly women of color. We also hope to have Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty on the show to talk about police reforms, but with several hundred people testifying before the Portland City Council about those reforms, she's been busy listening to their concerns and had to reschedule. We hope to have her on Straight Talk in the near future. Also, later in the show, NBC's Cynthia McFadden joins us to talk about the push for a nationwide vote-by-mail system like the one Oregon and Washington already have. First, welcome to my guest, Oregon First District Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Also joining us from Joyful Thank Noise you. Child Development Center is Caitlin Curtis. She's a preschool teacher. Caitlin is also the chair of the Oregon Association for the Education of Young Children's Public Policy Committee. Welcome to Stray Talk. It's nice to have you both here. Thank you, Laurel. Great to Thank be with you, you so much. Caitlin. We'll talk about the child care issue in just a moment, but first, let's start with the Congresswoman and steps Congress is taking to respond to demands to end racial injustices by law enforcement. Congresswoman, you joined a number of representatives and senators this week in introducing the Justice in Policing Act. What would it do? Well, the Justice and Policing Act is important. I also am co-sponsoring a resolution to, that condemns police brutality. But this important Justice and Policing Act takes several steps to address the systemic racism that we've seen uh, people out marching uh, here in Oregon uh, and across the country and around the world. So this act takes a lot of important steps. It increases transparency, bans, chokeholds, limits the transfer of military equipment to police uh, and also requires body cameras. But that transparency is really important so we can really get the data on police misconduct. This is so important to take these steps. And I know the state and our, our local leaders are taking steps as well uh, to address what, what is now being exposed as uh, systemic injustice and racism in our, our justice system. We need a, 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 a public safety system that keeps everyone safe and the Justice and Policing Act is a first step. And we'll continue to follow that. Thank you, Congresswoman. Let's bring Caitlin back to join us to talk about the pandemic and how it's affected child care. How has the pandemic affected joyful noise and have you been able to stay open? How have things changed because of the pandemic? Yeah, we initially had to close. Um, so for um, from middle of March through May, our center was closed. Um, we were able to acquire the um, Paycheck Protection Loan. And so we were able to be rehired or we were all laid off um, initially and then we were be able to be rehired starting on May 1st. So um, for all of us, we were all laid off for the month of April and we had to kind of navigate um, going through unemployment and then once we were rehired, we navigated figuring out how to provide resources to families and distance learning for the children that we serve. Um, and then July 1st, we were open as, or sorry, June 1st, we opened as a um, emergency care center. So it's been a, a difficult time. Congresswoman, you just released this report, Child Care in Crisis. What is happening with child care yes. providers in Oregon and across the country uh, because of the pandemic? How bad is the situation? Right. It, it's bad, Laurel, and it, I'm very concerned about it. But I want to emphasize that this was a crisis and something that I was working on even before the pandemic. And it's really in three <clears throat> parts. Number one, there's significant unmet need here in Oregon. A lot of our counties, if not all of our counties, have child care deserts, meaning there's one spot for every three children who need care. The second issue is high costs. 
childcare is too expensive for way too many families here in Oregon and across the country. Sometimes it's as much as a year of college and families just can't afford it. I listen to so many parents say it's stressful trying to piece together, especially if they have more than one child, how to afford a high, especially high quality childcare. And then the third piece of the crisis is low pay. Um, these uh, people who are like Caitlin, people who are working, taking care of children, our, our future leaders, the next generation, they make very low pay. In fact, many of them qualify for public assistance themselves. And if they have children, they struggle to find childcare for their own children. So the system is broken in three ways. Now, when you add the pandemic, it exacerbates all of those challenges. As Caitlin said, many of the centers had to close. Um, some were continuing to provide care to uh, essential frontline workers, but they had to limit the number of, of children they could take and also have exist uh, um, additional expenses, uh, personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies that they didn't have before. So it's exacerbated all of those challenges and then as people start going back to work, um, as our counties are reopening, uh, we need childcare to be there and we need it to be affordable. We simply are not going to be able to rebuild our economy if parents can't find childcare and if they can't afford it. So we can't just help the families because we need to also help the providers because the, the, the um, people who are providing the care need, deserve, need and deserve to be paid well. So uh, in the report, there are many stories talking about uh, really the, the personal way that this affects families. It affects our children, it affects our families, it affects the child care providers, and importantly, it affects the economy. We have some statistics to underscore what you just said, Congresswoman, that 60% of licensed child care providers in the U.S. have already closed due to the pandemic. That's from the Bipartisan Policy Center. And this is sobering. <clears throat> Only 11% of the nation's child care providers will survive the pandemic without government support. That comes from the Nas National Association for the Education of Young Children. Caitlin, what would that mean to families and child care providers and child care workers if that were to happen? Wow, I mean, so many families would be struggling without quality care and so many educators would be out of work. You know, child care has been underfunded and undervalued for decades. And right before the pandemic, we were finally getting our field on the national stage. And so having to close and shut down has really made our field take a huge hit. Congresswoman, you and other House leaders were hoping to get $100 billion into the next coronavirus relief package, the HEROES Act. From what I understand, just a fraction of that amount was included. How important is it to get that money and, and what are the other options? It's, it's really important. As I explained, we aren't going to be able to open up our economy um, and our economy won't thrive if we don't have high quality uh, early childhood education and childcare for our working families. Um, and it is a good investment. Yes, we did get some, and we got some funding in the CARES Act, uh, which passed earlier, and we got some in the HEROES Act, which has passed the House, but not the Senate. But is, as you said, Laurel, it is a fraction of what we need. We are asking for in the child care is essential um, bill, we're asking for 50 billion and then a, which I want to note is not as much as we spent to um, save the airline industry. The airline industry is important. So are our children. So we're asking for 50 billion in uh, the um, Child Care is Essential Act and another, for short term and then a, another 50 billion to continue providing that care. And I just wanna emphasize again, um, what a good investment this is. When our children have high quality uh, early childhood education, they enter the K-12 system uh, ready to learn. Then the, we spend less on safety net services. We spend uh, less, um, we, we're addressing school to prison pipeline. We're addressing inequities that exist in our system. I also want to emphasize that a lot of the child care providers are women and particularly black women and women of color. Um, having uh, 
pay they deserve for this important work is a critical piece of this as well. Making sure that we are valuing the work of early childhood educators because it is so important. And there are, you need, there are plenty of economists who uh, have found that these investments pay for themselves going forward. We, we are investing in our children, we are investing in our, our educators, and that's an investment in our future that saves us money, but also is good for, for our economy in the long run. But parent needs to stay home because they can't afford, afford childcare. Maybe that's somebody who was going to find a, developed a coronavirus vaccine or um, find a way to build an inexpensive electric car. There's so much, so much potential that could be lost if people can't work because they can't afford child care. You, you pointed out that this uh, fixing the child care system is an issue of racial justice as well. And if the HEROES Act passes Indeed. in the Senate, I understand there's about $10 billion in that for Oregon. Is there any chance of accessing some of that funding for child care in the state? Well, I would certainly hope so. And right now, uh, it primar the funding that comes to Oregon primarily goes through the child care development block grants. And then those go into the um, ERDC or the employment related daycare program. What we need to do is make sure that th right now they're serving a fraction of the need, as we explained in all these um, conversations that I've had with, with struggling parents and child care providers who are really struggling to get by because they don't don't make a, a living wage. Uh, this is a good investment and we need to get that funding yeah. to our state to get to our providers so they can make sure that everyone can afford uh, high quality child care. Caitlin, what are your biggest worries and what are you hearing from parents? You know, parents, they're stressed right now. They're trying to navigate working from home, some of them full time, um, while also trying to coordinate their schedules with, you know, distance learning for their children or caring for young children. Um, it's, it's a really stressful time for parents right now. And without quality care that they feel comfortable sending their children to, they aren't able to properly do their jobs. And so that's why it's really important that we get government funding and so that we can recover from from the hit that we've taken from COVID-19, but also to create a sustainable childcare system going forward. And you are on a critical public policy committee. What challenges has Oregon faced historically when it comes to childcare and the challenges faced by childcare workers? You know, Congresswoman laid it out when she said that we are a childcare desert in Oregon. You know, most of our counties, we don't have enough spaces for the children who need them. And so, that's why it's so important that we continue to fund so we can continue to open centers and create spaces for children so that everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic status, can have access to high quality care. Congresswoman, how important do you think it is to the nation's child care system to restarting this economy and recovering to, from the pandemic? How important is fixing the child care system right now to recovery? It's essential. The bottom line is no, ch no child care, no economic recovery, because parents will not be able to go back to work. Uh, and all of the people who work in the child care system, I want to note, um, Caitlin has a, a, a degree, a college degree, um, and m the accredited child care centers here in Oregon um, require a certain percentage of the people working there to have college degrees. So now we have people who are not making very much and they have student loan payments as well. So what we need to do is make this investment it is a robust investment, a structural change, and make sure that we have affordable, high quality childcare here in Oregon. Without it, we won't have a, a true economic recovery. Um, parents, as Caitlin said, are stressed and struggling. They can't go back to work with confidence and really dedicate themselves to work if they can't find, find childcare. There's a, a story in the in the report about a, a, a woman with more than one child who said it's, it's, it's like a, a second job trying to piece together childcare and make it work. We need to make it easier. We need to make it high quality. And we need to make sure that the providers of this very important uh, care and getting our students, re our, our children ready to be students, ready to be uh, members of our community are, are paid well. So it's essential. I want to shift topics for a That's moment. That's why it's the Child Care is Essential Act. Yeah. 
I, I want to shift topics just for a moment because our next segment is on vote by mail. And we saw a breakdown in voting in elections in Georgia this week. And Congresswoman, you've been advocating for an expansion of vote by mail and for more voter rights protections. What do you want to see happen with the vote by mail system? And can it happen before the November election? It certainly can if there is the will to do it. And uh, vote by mail, we've been doing that here in Oregon safely and securely for more than 20 years. It's a good system. And especially during a pandemic, I saw the people standing in line first you know, in, in Wisconsin and other states. But uh, in, in Georgia, it was outrageous how long people had to stand in line. Um, and in, in counties, particularly with high populations of black families and minorities, it, it looks like voter suppression. It's, it's that, that is completely unacceptable. But during a pandemic and always, uh, voting is a fundamental right, it's part of our democracy. And every state should be looking at Oregon because we have figured out how to do it safely and security. And the House has passed legislation called HR1, a good government bill uh, to incentivize expanding vote by mail nationally. And I also support uh, a, a national vote by mail piece of legislation that will help states implement vote by mail across the country. We know how to do it. We know how to do it safely and securely. Uh, and every state should look at Oregon and follow our lead. I want to bring Caitlin back uh, to the child care issue. Um, do you have a bottom line what you want to share with people at home about how important this issue is? Absolutely. You know, parents can't pay any more, but teachers can't make any less. And so it's so important that that we fund child care so that we can create a system going forward that supports the families so that they can have access, but also supports the teachers and the educators so that they can have um, so that they can make sure that they have a living wage and are able to support themselves as well. And Congresswoman, just about 15 seconds left. A final thought? A budget is a statement of our priorities and how we spend federal dollars is a statement of our values. I value and everyone should be valuing our children, the next generation. We need to make sure they get a good start in life. We need to make childcare affordable and accessible for everyone who needs it. And we need to make sure that those great early childhood uh, educators are making a living wage, educating the next generation. Congresswoman, and also thank you very much, Caitlin, for joining us. Just always a pleasure to have you here. When we come thank back, you, Laurel. Thank, you. thank you, Caitlin. We continue our conversation about vote by mail. We talk with NBC's Cynthia McFadden about her investigation into the vote by mail system. Is it unfair, like some critics suggest? What are the hurdles to establishing vote by mail nationwide? What she found out coming up next. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Vote by mail. Oregon's been doing it for more than 20 years. Washington State moved to vote by mail in 2011. Now there's a push to move to a nationwide vote by mail system before the November election. President Trump is opposed and says it would lead to a quote rigged election. NBC's Cynthia McFadden has been investigating vote by mail for quite some time. She joined our Galen Etlin to tell us what her investigation has found. Cynthia, thank you for speaking with us here. The president often claims mail in elections are rigged. What has your investigative reporting shown? Well, while there are some instances where vote by mail ballots have been compromised, they are very small in relationship to the number of ballots cast. In fact, all of the experts we talked to said there is absolutely no evidence that vote by mail leads to rigged elections. They said it definitively, including the, the woman who runs the program at the Brennan Center, a nonpartisan center at New York University, which studies elections. Now, the coronavirus pandemic makes expanding vote by mail systems much more urgent right now around the country. And Oregon Senator Ron Wyden has pushed for national vote by mail systems for years. What's the logistical hurdle, though, for that to come together before November? 
Well, the question of whether the other states can catch up to Oregon is a good one. Um, we were out in Oregon a few years ago uh, looking at your system and, and talking to two of your, one former and at the time the current Secretary of State, one Republican, one Democrat, widely embraced in Oregon, of course. Um, so uh, four other states besides Oregon have um, entirely vote-by-mail systems, by which I mean you get a ballot in the mail whether you ask for one or not if you are a registered voter. Um, there are a lot of hurdles to putting this in place um, in such a short time order. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that you have all those authentications of the signatures. You want to be sure that you can uh, authenticate the ballots. And um, and and in, or in Colorado, as you know, they actually trace ballots the way they trace uh, mail deliveries uh, for uh, FedEx or UPS. So there are a lot of things to put in place uh, in advance and a lot of money and time needed, which uh, may not be forthcoming. Uh, but many states are going to make an attempt just to try to keep their, their folks safe and also to try to increase uh, voter turnout. As you know, in places where, like Oregon, where there is vote by mail, voter turnout tends to be much higher than it is in the rest of the states. Now, just for some context, in some state primaries on Tuesday, there were delays from malfunctioning equipment, long lines, and not enough ballots, period. Could voting by mail help solve some of those issues? Absolutely. Uh, you know, listen, think back. Uh, January, February seems like a long time ago now, but think of those lines in Houston and in Los Angeles. I mean, people in Los Angeles and Houston voted seven, wait, stood in line to vote seven, eight, nine hours sometimes. You know, you could make an argument that that is an interference in the right to vote. Um, most of us wouldn't want to or be able to do that. So sure, um, some of the equipment problems that we've seen all over the country, both uh, challenges, the, uh, the online uh, you know, people have said, oh, the systems aren't online. Well, we've discovered in several states the systems still are online, so not entirely safe. Um, a lot of the problems that have arisen uh, in the voting system could be addressed if the nation moved towards vote by mail. And uh, this, uh, the coronavirus may be providing an opportunity for some states to do that. As you know, however, um, in California, uh, the governor announced that he was going to send ballots to everyone at home. The Republican Party has taken him to court over that. So we'll see how that all shakes out. Now, looking at the other side of this, too, voters overwhelmingly do support vote by mail here in Oregon, in Washington. You mentioned our turnout is generally pretty high. What are you hearing from voters in other states? Yeah, I mean, people are enthusiastic about it. I mean, in, 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 in part, perhaps, because the pandemic has focused the mind. I mean, people do not want to have to go and stand in public for hours to, to vote. So uh, for that reason alone, many voters tell us they are very enthusiastic about the possibility of voting at home. It's convenient. You don't have to do it on a set day or time. You can uh, study the ballot. You can uh, muse on it. You can fill it out when you have time to do so. So we are hearing a lot of enthusiasm from voters for, for vote by mail. You know, people want to make sure it's safe. Um, but as we know from Oregon, Colorado and other states, there are ways to ensure the safety. That's not to say there will never be irregularities. I mean, any system designed by humans, uh, you know, is subject to being uh, abused by humans. But by and large, there is really no evidence, according to all of the experts we talked to, to support the president's position that vote by mail leads to fraud. Uh, you know, one expert said to us, it's so uh, odd that the president seems to be undermining the entire electoral system, a system by which he was elected. Now, looking at some of the challenges you mentioned earlier, states like California have invested so much money in upgrading voting machines. Is it possible for states to make a quick pivot to another system? Good question. Uh, some of the folks we talked to both in the states and at the federal level, experts who study this say without a huge influx of uh, federal money, it probably won't be possible for a lot of states to make the pivot. Um, and yet, uh, voters are going to be demanding absentee ballots. Even if uh, the state doesn't go to a full-on vote-by-mail system, you just know that many voters are going to be writing in and asking for absentee ballots. So they're going to have to deal with a new reality one way or another. And uh, they're hoping to get uh, some federal funds quickly to be able to put these systems in place. Um, you know, politically, uh, some jurisdictions have, as you say, spent enormous sums of money over the last several years buying new voting equipment. It's going to be a political uh, snarl 
uh, to now say, hey, by the way, we didn't need those after all. We'll be watching what happens next. Cynthia McFadden, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And that's our show for this week. Thank you for watching and listening. Don't forget to download our new podcast. Here's a QR code that will take you to a link where you can download it or get it wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for KGW Straight Talk. You can also catch us here on air Friday nights at 7, Saturday and Sundays at 6.30, and Monday mornings at 4.30. We'll see you next week for Straight Talk. Have a great week.